Today we are talking about the coronavirus stimulus package and what it really means for you and those affected by rare disease. We have Chris Porter um, here from Retrofin to talk to us. He's the Vice President of Government Affairs and Policy at Retrofin. So he's gonna present to us and talk us through and walk us through this. Um, just a few housekeeping uh, rules we kind of want to go over before. We just ask you to mute yourself. Um, if you do want to ask a question, they're highly encouraged. You can uh, ask a question via the chat feature, the Q&A feature. Um, I think there's an option you can raise your hand via Zoom and, and you can ask uh, out loud if you'd rather prefer to do that. But um, yes, and just a reminder, this is streaming on our Facebook page. So anything you do bring up uh, is going out there as well. So to start things off, uh, just give you a quick introduction on Chris. Chris Porter has over 20 years of government and public affairs experience with deep healthcare policy know-how and advocacy successes spanning Congress, the executive branch, and state governments. As I mentioned before, he's the Vice President of Government Affairs at Retrofin. Chris leads the development and execution of all legislative policy and political strategies for Retrofin before the US Congress, states, and the executive branch, specializing in external partnerships and internal cross-functional teams. He has used the simple principles of listening to patients and acting to make sure their voices are heard to create a robust track record of advocacy successes. So I will now share Chris's uh, presentation and turn it over to him. Super, thank you for that, Kylie. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Super. Well, great. It's a pleasure to be with everybody this afternoon. And uh, I want to thank Nefkir, uh, not only for taking the time uh, to do this important webinar, but also giving me a reason to take a shower today. So I got up <laughs> and uh, dealing, working with home, we're all working through that. Uh, but, you know, I, I thank you, Kylie, thank Lauren, thank the whole team at NEFCURE for everything that you're doing for families who are living with rare kidney disease. Uh, it's a voice that is really needed in Washington and across the country, and we're very, uh, we feel honored to be able to partner with you on initiatives like this. You know, like most, uh, most people at Retrofin, um, I come from this with a personal connection. Uh, I come from a rare disease family myself, having lived with rare disease for uh, a number of years. So I can't imagine uh, what a lot of the, the NEFCARE families are do going through right now. Um, the only thing I can think of that's a comparator was 9-11. Uh, we had some of our hardest and darkest moments as a rare disease family during 9-11, but you know, we didn't have to compete with hospitals for, um, for attention at that time. So uh, anyway, everybody at Retrofin, on behalf of all the leadership and all of our employees across the country, uh, we're here to try to do what we can to help you and your family through this. So what I wanna to do today, uh, real quickly, is just give you an overview of legislation um, that might affect you, might affect your family, might affect you as a rare disease leader um, and, or as, as a community leader. And there's been so much that's happened over the last 20 days that it's tough to make sense of it. So the list that I put together is not exhaustive, but hopefully it's some, some of this will be meaningful to you. And, um, and certainly we welcome to have a, a longer conversation uh, uh, about any of the things that I bring up or even anything that you've heard about in the news. So if you could advance the slide, that would be great. So just to get a handle on what kind of, your Congress is at work, um, and this is what's happened over the last 20 days. So essentially they've passed three major bills to try to deal with coronavirus. Uh, the first one they did um, just about a month ago, which was to really jumpstart the government's uh, response at, at the Department of Health and Human Services, at the Centers for Disease Control, and the FDA to make an initial response uh, to, to attack the coronavirus. Um, about, what was that, almost two weeks after that, uh, they passed the Families First Response Act, and that was designed to try to give protections to workers um, and to help the system accommodate folks that might be 
uh, unemployed or have to take leave to care with somebody with uh, suffering from COVID. So as you can see from the slide there, if you are a small company or a, by small company, Washington says less than 500 employees, uh, you had to provide uh, essentially two weeks of additional emergency paid sick leave. Um, you got to do uh, up to 10 additional weeks of family medical leave at two thirds pay. And then to help offset the costs for small employers, uh, they also provided tax credits in that legislation so that the employers would be able to do that. So employees or employers with more than 500 employees uh, were not included in that. Uh, the, the assumption was that the businesses that had fewer than 500 employees were the ones that would have the biggest difficulty providing the, the, the paid sick leave and the family medical leave. And then um, they also said that if you were fewer than 50 employees, and you think that providing these benefits, you know, would threaten your existence as a company, you're allowed to apply for an exemption. So some of that is still being worked out. There are still some, there are some frequently asked questions, uh, some facts that are available uh, as they've gone to implement these policies. Um, but, uh, but that was the purpose of the second major legislation that they did was to try to address uh, family medical leave and paid sick leave. And then just, uh, I guess just last week, a little over a week ago, they passed this enormous wide ranging $2 trillion stimulus bill that touches all parts of the economy. And that's really what I want to focus on for you all today. You've probably heard about bits and pieces of it in the news. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about a few sections on it. And if there are any other uh, questions that you have about it, we can, we can take them at the end. Um, I also want to, mentioned that you know last week's unemployment numbers uh, were staggering and they really jolted Washington into an agreement that was made to try to do another coronavirus bill sooner rather than later. Um, the folks are thinking that the two trillion dollars that was passed, which is an enormous sum of money, uh, bigger than anything that's been done in the past, but they're already thinking that it won't be enough given by the response to some of these programs. So they may move sooner rather than later uh, in trying to address it and to add more money to these, um, to these initiatives. So let's take a look at, the, at these bills real quick. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, you've probably heard about these. Uh, they're gonna do what they call recovery rebate checks. Uh, they think that these will be in the mail or a direct deposit uh, within a, a week or two and in the mail within three weeks. Um, but they are gonna take a while to get out into the system. So there's, um, they're based on your 2018 or 2019 returns. Uh, every individual who are below those income levels, uh, or I'm sorry, um, let, let me just first, the amounts are $1,200 and $500 for each child. So it phases out over 75,000 for individual and over $150,000 for a couple filing jointly. So in essence, if you make under 200,000 jointly, you will get uh, some relief um, and, and, a, and either a direct deposit or a check from the government. Second thing is that they've done is they've made it easier to take money out of your 401k. Uh, if you have a COVID related emergency and they don't make you, you know, prove it or put any paperwork, they'll just take your word on it. You're allowed to take up to $100,000 out of your 401k and repay it over three years. For those of you who work for companies that have um, offer loan programs, they've raised the maximum loan that you can take out of your 401k and repay it under those types of programs up to 100,000. And again, you're able to repay it over a longer period of time. So those are two ways that they're trying to give access to, to capital to people. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is the unemployment benefits. Uh, whatever your state does, they've added 13 weeks on top of it. They've created a $600 uh, payment on top of whatever your state gives. And they're also now implementing rules to expand unemployment eligibility to include hourly workers, the self-employed and gig workers. So, you know, if you are depending on, or you drive for Uber, 
part time, for example, they want to make sure you know that you're able to try to uh, to, to have access to unemployment. And a couple other uh, initiatives that they're done, they know that this is impacting both uh, state schools as well as local public schools. So they are uh, putting a large amount of money, $12 billion, uh, to, that will be distributed by formula for immediate needs, including special education, and then $14 billion for colleges and universities to try to deal with uh, the upheaval that they're having as so many students like ours are. We have two college age kids who are home and trying to finish their, their classes online. So the next one. Hey Chris, had a couple of questions, yeah. if you don't mind. Uh, the first question is, what if I made more sure. than 75,000 as a single adult? Is there a prorated amount that I can still get? Yes, yeah, it goes up to, it's, it's, it's 5% less, for or it's one percent less for every five thousand over. I think if you're an individual, you will still get something if you make up to ninety nine thousand dollars. Great, thank you. And then one more question for this slide: Is there a tax implication to getting the relief aid money? Uh, it is. Uh, it is. Well, actually, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, it's. I do know that for the four hundred one k withdrawals, you still are, have to pay tax on it like you would ordinary income. Uh, I don't know about the recovery rebates. There's a law called the Federal, or the Stafford Act, which says that payments made in a national emergency are not taxable. I don't know whether those uh, apply to those uh, rebate checks, uh, but it's a great question and we can look into that. Great, thank you. Sure, good question. Okay, uh, other, other things that affect all the families. Uh, your FSAs, remember, you used to be able to, to buy over-the-counter medicine with it, you know, your Advil, Advil and Tylenol and whatnot. Um, and then they took that away in 2017. Well, now they're giving it back. So you'll be able to use your flexible spending account that you might get to buy over-the-counter medicine. You'll also be able to use your, um, your healthcare savings account to buy over-the-counter medicine. And they've also added uh, menstrual products as, as being eligible. So those are all retroactive to the beginning of the year, um, but that's uh, the, it's an improved, so if you have a, a flexible spending account, uh, check with the folks that administer it about how you can uh, tap into those new benefits. Um, Congress also said that you know any treatment uh, for any vaccines or, or treatments that are developed for COVID that your insurance is not allowed to charge you any type of uh, cost sharing. So you should get those with any out-of-pocket costs. And then one really major thing that I think will affect everybody in healthcare is uh, they've really dramatically changed the rules around telehealth. And maybe you've already seen this, um, that your doctor's office might not have done virtual visits before, but now they are. Um, my wife, in fact, just yesterday uh, did uh, a virtual visit for the very first time. Um, and this has dramatic uh, implications for everybody, uh, but particularly people with, who have rare disease, particularly if you have a you know, nephrologist that you like who might not be located close to you or you move away from somebody that you like, um, they, they removed a lot of the rules, so you might be able now to have an opportunity to be able to see, um, you know, a doctor that might have been otherwise difficult for you to see. So a lot of those rules are changing, and even though they're supposed to be temporary, I don't think they're going to go back. I think those are going to be part of the system forever. Um, specifically to, you know, if you unfortunately have somebody who's uh, <clears throat> doing on home dialysis, they, they got rid of the rule that said that the, the doctor has to see you face to face um, uh, in order to, to do your, your, your regular visits. Um, so they can uh, do that uh, you know, telephonically now. Um, you can also have new patients and, and doctors can take new patients uh, rather than having to see them in person, they can see them um, that way. And then last week to help, uh, these providers scale up. Uh, the FCC uh, announced $200 million that folks could apply to to try to, to beef up their services so that they can actually deliver telehealth 
and become even more accessible uh, to, to their patients. So that's one of the uh, one of the outcomes that I think is going to be affect us all for a very long time. I know uh, one thing that rear families worry about too, particularly when they're in rural areas, is accessing their treatment, uh, and accessing uh, the doctors that they care about most. There was some extra money that was included for rural hospitals, and they gave uh, they gave all money um, or all, all hospitals a bonus uh, of twenty percent on whatever they normally charge Medicare to be able to treat patients who develop COVID-19. So as you see, there's a lot that is happening to try to support hospitals and support your local uh, communities. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So uh, from the economic side, I wanted to point out a couple things. You probably have heard about this Paycheck uh, Protection Initiative. Uh, this is an enormous $367 billion program. To give you a, a frame of reference, uh, our entire defense budget is a little over $700 billion uh, in an annual year. So these are, these are no small amounts of sums of money uh, that they are dedicating to try to, to make sure that uh, both companies, cities, and nonprofits can stay afloat and continue to make payroll. Under this uh, Paycheck Protection Initiative, if you don't reduce payroll, if you don't reduce benefits, if you keep people on board and keep their checks flowing for up to eight weeks, uh, the government will forgive uh, you know, uh, the, the loan in the long run. Uh, it was rolled out last Friday. It was enormously po uh, popular. The banks had trouble processing all the, um, all the loans. Um, so last night they released a, a frequently asked questions. The Small Business Administration did as well as the Department of Treasury to try to help implement that program. So if that is something that interests you, you know, please don't give up. Keep trying to work with your local banks um, to try to access that because it's designed to do one thing and that's to able to keep um, payroll, uh, try to reduce um, unemployment and furloughs. Uh, and, and I want to reiterate it's not just for small businesses uh, 501c3s are explicitly included as are cities uh, and municipalities um, and just this afternoon we heard that they might add another 250 billion dollars to this uh, on, on Thursday evening uh, the Senate is talking about doing that so that even though there's you know there's had some problems rolling it out uh, even though there's tremendous interest in it there's a keen um, uh, there's a lot of people that want to make sure that, that it succeeds. You've probably heard about the, the big economic stabilization fund. Uh, that's for giant industries, you know, airlines, businesses that are critical to national security. Um, so all the you know, big or big, giant industries that are hurt the hardest um, by the coronavirus, they'll be able to apply for uh, loans and grants. Uh, from the Department of Treasury. One thing to point out is that that stabilization funds includes 100 or $150 billion for local and state stimulus programs. So wherever you live across the country, you might have a local stimulus program or a state program that's created in the next week, you know, in the next couple of weeks. So please keep your eyes open for that. Um, in this next round of funding, there might be um, additional money to try to reach the smaller cities. Uh, some people in Congress are are are, um, are 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 trying to make that happen. And last, I know for for all nonprofits and patient groups, um, many of you are involved with NEFCURE. Many of you are involved in other organizations. They did a few things to try to um, to spur charitable giving. Uh, one is this write-off uh, for all taxpayers, whether you file. Um, uh, you really take the standard deduction of whether you itemize, everybody will be able to write off uh, $300 next year, providing you give $300 to any 501c3 charity. And then for uh, other organizations that might try to get bigger donors, they've limited the amount. Uh, there used to be a limit on how much uh, an individual could write off that they give. That was the old number, I think it was 25%. Uh, they've increased that to 50%. So uh, a donor give up to 50% of their 
uh, income uh, to charity. Same thing with corporations, they've lifted that to 25%, and then they've also provided an incentive for food. So all those are very meaningful uh, provisions that they're hoping will help uh, nonprofits, uh, including patient groups of all different kinds, weather this storm. So let, be, before we conclude, um, and, I, and I'm happy to take more questions, you can go on to the next slide. Kylie, thank you. Um, there's a couple things that, uh, a couple other things just to point out. Um, a number of people have asked, or we've heard about people who are interested in, you know, what happens if you get laid off and you lose your health insurance coverage. So there's nothing in the bill right now that calls for specific premium assistance for somebody who loses their job. Of course, most people who uh, leave will have an access uh, to a COBRA plan. Um, but if you don't have access to a COBRA plan, anytime you lose your job, respective of what the national situation is, anytime you lose your job, you are eligible for what's called a special enrollment um, privilege or the special enrollment program. And you're able to access the individual healthcare market, so your Obamacare plans or your ACA plans in your state. So even though it, they don't need to do this you know, and, and just open up all the, the, the exchanges in one fell swoop. They could do that, but they've decided not to do that. But whether they do that or not, anybody who loses their job for 60 days qualifies for a special enrollment period, um, which allows you to buy a, a, uh, an Obamacare healthcare plan. So that's, a, that's definitely an option for people. We're also at Retrofin, where we know that there's been a big impact on families losing their caregivers. Um, if you had care that came in to help you with a loved one, um, so we are actually exploring ways to try that may, to try to address that issue in the next stimulus legislation. Um, if that's something that affects you and you're interested in trying to get involved, please please let us know. Um, and then the last thing I want to point out uh, is that if you or people in your local community are having trouble accessing supplies that you need to make sure um, and consider talking to your local member of Congress. So you, you might love your local member of Congress, you might hate your local member of Congress, uh, but in times of crisis, uh, these district offices, the offices that they have in their community often become hubs of activity to try to make sure that people have the supplies they need. So if there's something that you are not getting or your local hospital isn't getting, it's worth calling your, your local uh, congressman or congresswoman's office, uh, your local senate office, if it's nearby, uh, and say, hey, we're, I'm from this part of your district, and this, this is what our community needs. A lot of times, they help connect people who need things with the people who have them, and it's an option you might not regularly consider. So that concludes my, uh, my presentation as it is right now. I just wanna, before we take questions, I just wanna say that uh, this is my email. Um, you know, as, as I started with, we're a rare family, just like you are. Uh, we've struggled with a lot of these, uh, the implications of having these diseases ourselves. So you're always welcome to, to reach out to me. Uh, send me a line, drop me a note, and if I, I'll do my best to answer you. And if I don't know, I will uh, I'll try to put you in touch with somebody who does. But thanks so much, Nefkir, for giving me the chance today. And I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Kylie. Hey, Chris, we did have one question uh, that, that reads, outside of relief aid and money to small businesses to help keep people on payroll, does the bill offer other mechanisms to help me if I can't pay my bills? Uh, it's tough for me to say because I'm not sure of your specific situation, um, but I think the, the bill does, un it, the, it, the, the main sources of support are unemployment, uh, paycheck protection, uh, and economic stabilization. So the, the, whoever asked that question, the one thing I would say is, is keep an eye out for a local or a state stimulus plan in your particular region because there is money that's, a, that's um, 
you know, that's in the package that was just passed that's going to roll out locally. And it, those, those decisions will be made by people closer to wherever you live uh, and in the state that you live. Does anyone else have any questions for Chris? Okay. Um, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time and going through that with us. Um, again, uh, his Chris's email is chris.porter at retrofund.com. Feel free to reach out to him or to us. Um, you can always email info at nefcare.org or my personal email is kwinkler, W-I-N-K-L-E-R at nefcare.org um, with any other questions about this or other just support or resources in general. So thank you very much again, Chris. Um, we really appreciate it. it my pleasure, Kylie. Best to everybody there and for everybody listening, stay he healthy and safe. And we look forward to talking to you soon. Definitely. Thank you. Bye.